Welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. Um, we're glad you're here with us. The webinar is um, Safe and Smart Exercises for Diabetes. So that's what we, we'll be discussing this evening. Um, if should you have any technical difficulties during the broadcast, please call um, Log Me In Support. There's a phone number there at the bottom. It's 1-800-263-6317. So thank you all for being here. Um, our format includes a short presentation followed by an interactive discussion. To type in a question, use the question section of the webinar toolbar. At the end, you'll have a chance to ask questions. So we look forward to an interactive webinar this evening. We know that the information you're about to hear may motivate you to make lifestyle changes, so please consult your physician before making any changes to your current routine. The Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist will provide strategies to help you manage your diabetes. This online Q&A session is intended to give general advice this information is not a substitute for personal medical advice and involves the professional opinion of the Cecilia Health Certified Diabetes Care and Education Specialist. Our webinar leader this evening is Laura Ashley Johnson. Um, she's been practicing, um, she's been a practicing registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist for 10 years. She's from Irvine, Kentucky, but now lives in Houston, Texas. Um, Laura has a passion for nutrition and enjoys cooking for her family. Some of her other hobbies are watching Kentucky basketball, traveling with her family, and spending time with her Norfolk Terrier named Butter. So thank you so much for being with us this evening, Laura. Uh, you may take it away. Thank y'all so much. I'm excited to see we have such a good crowd tonight. So like she said, as we move forward through this, if you have questions, just write them in the comment box and I will look at them as we conclude today. So here's our agenda today. We've got a lot we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the benefits of being physically active and the research that supports why we should be more physically active. We're going to talk about how much exercise is enough and how to manage your blood glucose as you maybe start your new exercise or physical activity routine, how to maybe make some adjustments with your medications along the way, and then we'll address the questions and answers at the end. So here's where we usually see ourselves trip up right out from the start. You know, there are a lot of challenges and reasons, excuses, whatever you'd like to call it. There are lots of things that are expressed as roadblocks to being physically active or having more exercise in your routine. You don't enjoy it. You're tired of the starting and quitting cycle. Maybe you can't afford a gym membership. You're not seeing the changes in your body that you're wanting to see. You don't know how to exercise the right way. Maybe that, that equipment's a little overwhelming to see it and you don't really know how to use it. Maybe there's some childcare issues. Time might be an issue. Maybe you're too, too stressed, too tired, too sore. There's lots of things that I hear as roadblocks. Some of these are harder than others to fix or maybe to overcome in order to get that into your routine. But under most circumstances, you can make it work if you truly, truly want to get exercise into your routine. So let's start out with why we even want to do it in the first place. Why do we want to be physically active? There are many, many mental, emotional, and physical benefits to regular exercise. It can reduce the risk of developing or dying from heart disease or stroke reduce blood pressure and risk of developing hypertension. It increases healthy cholesterol, that HDL. It decreases triglycerides and bad cholesterol, which is the LDL. It can increase your metabolism, which can help with weight loss. You know, regular exercise can also strengthen bones and muscles and slow the loss of bone density. It can help you rest and sleep better at night can also decrease stress and anxiety. And we've also seen that it can also regulate hormones and those blood sugar levels. So here's a great little um, caricature to kind of show how this actually works and how in exercise can help insulin work. Physical activity 
has wonderful positive effects on insulin sensitivity. It helps insulin work better. Envision sugar floating in your blood. So think of like, uh, just uh, put your hands together like a circle and think of these little sugars fl flowing through there. It's in there floating around and waiting for insulin to unlock the cell so it can exit the blood and go inside the cell. Kind of think of the insulin as like the doorkeeper. It has the key that unlocks it so it can get out of there. Your, your sugar that you have, it gives you energy. So when you're using your muscles more, they need more sugar too. So you have this effect of sugar coming out of the blood and into the cells and muscles more because they need more. You're burning more. So we really have a great uh, impact on your blood sugar management. So there was a trial, this was a research study that happened in um, 2001. It's called the Diabetes Prevention Program. It was a randomized clinical trial to prevent type 2 diabetes in persons at risk. And it was a major trial aimed at discovering whether diet and exercise or the oral diabetes drug metformin could prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in people with prediabetes. So in 2001, there were 27 clinical centers around the country that they were split into random groups. There was the lifestyle group that received intensive training in diet, exercise, and behavior modification. They were eating less fat, calories, and exercising 150 minutes a week. So a five to 7% weight loss was recommended for this group. And they met with the researchers 16 times in 24 weeks, and then two months with at least one call in between visits. So they were getting a ton of communication and support and motivation. The second group took 850 milligrams of metformin twice a day, and then the third group got placebo pills. So the second and third group, they got a little info on diet and exercise, but no intensive counseling efforts like the first group. In total, there were 3,234 participants. So it was a big research study. So let's take a look at what, what happened as a result of this. So versus the placebo, the incidence of diabetes with the lifestyle group, so the first group that had all the, all the interactions and education, it showed a 58% reduction and a 31% less with the, than the metformin group. So comparing the lifestyle to metformin, it showed a 39% reduction with lifestyle. So it was clinically proven, and this study was paramount in showing how effective lifestyle changes are in blood sugar management and preventing the onset of type 2 diabetes. And here's another slide that shows one of the, one of the kind of culprits and things that can really impact um, diabetes and blood sugar management and how exercise can help with this. So studies conducted over the past 15 years have noted that complications frequently found in obese patients appear to be associated with that location of that excess fat rather than the weight in, in general. So that, that fat right there on the belly that sometimes settles there, it's that one that so many patients are just like, oh, I'm so frustrated. What can I do? I want to get rid of this. So it's that fat right there in the belly. The patient with abdominal obesity and metabolic syndrome is at a high risk for coronary artery disease, type 2, type two diabetes, and other related diseases. Um, they also tend to have um, cholesterol issues. They have oftentimes high triglycerides, that HDL and LDL. And I'll just give you guys a, a quick tip when you're looking at cholesterol, because this is one question I get a lot. They can't tell the difference between the HDL and the LDL, and they can't remember what their doctor says. Think of H in the HDL, it's healthy. The H, healthy. The LDL is bad. We want that one, think of L, we want it to be low. So the L, that can help you differentiate the two. So with that extra belly fat, we see lower HDLs and we want that one to be high and we see higher LDLs and we want that one to be low. So one thing that you can do is to measure around the belly, the waist circumference with the tape measure and it can be used to kind of assess what, what the changes are happening as you're incorporating more activity in your belly. I did this all the time when I used to meet with patients one-on-one -on -one because they may not see their, their weight change as they were doing all these things, changes with their diet and their exercise, 
But if I measured them, they could see the inches going down and that was a real encouragement. So that's something you could do to see how the, effect, you know, the efforts that you're putting in are really working. So let's talk about cardiovascular risk factors. And we wanna do more exercise because we don't want these factors in our life, but there are several things that are very um, dependent on choices that you're making. So along with that excess abdominal fat, the family history. You know, if you have blood relatives that have coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease before the age of 60, then you're at a higher risk. You know, you can't control your heredity, but you can help reduce other risk factors that we're gonna talk about below. Smoking, another one. Nicotine, it narrows the blood vessels, causing an increase in your blood pressure and your heart rate. And then also that carbon monoxide, it competes with oxygen in your red blood cells. So there is less oxygen carried to the heart. It increases the risk of heart disease by damaging the artery wall and allowing more cholesterol to deposit on the wall. Smoking reduces that HDL, that good one that we want high. It lowers that one and it makes blood thicker and easier to form clots. So smoking, definitely something you wanna work on if that's something in your, your daily habits. What can you do? You know, stop smoking one day at a time. One day at a time, don't make grand goals, but maybe it's something you wean off. Some people do go cold turkey, but see what works for you. Plan other activities to help avoid smoking. You can do activities like chewing gum, find another hobby. You know, ask a friend to help you quit. You know, determine what are your triggers. You know, is there something that's bringing you to get that puff or go in to get the cigarette? Is there something that is your trigger? Um, talk about your goals with your doctor as there are some programs in different areas and communities that um, you could participate in as kind of a support group. And there are medications out there, too, that can help with some people to quit smoking as well. OK, hypertension is a risk factor. That's the high blood pressure. You know, blood pressure is the amount of force on the artery wall when your heart pumps and relaxes with each heartbeat. So a normal is 120 over 80 and high is 140 over 90. The narrowed blood vessels that happen with hypertension, it increases the pressure causing your heart to have to work harder. So just think of it like if you, again, if maybe you put your, your hand in a circle, like you're making a, the, the letter O and the blood has to flow through there. If you squeeze that circle to be smaller, it's gonna take more force to push that liquid through that hole. So that's what's happening when your blood pressure is high. So to prevent hypertension, but you know, take your medicines. If you take hypertension medications, make sure you take it as it's prescribed. You know, lose weight, like stop smoking, lowering your, your sodium in your diet. You know, there are certain amounts that your doctor might prescribe for you. You know, get regular with exercise and also limit limiting alcohol. Um, the high cholesterol that we mentioned earlier, that cholesterol, if that's high, it's like a fatty wax that builds up like a substance in your blood. So the HDL, that healthy one, it's good because they carry out the extra fat away from the arteries and the LDL is bad because it helps build up more fat on the artery wall. So you should have your cholesterol checked at least once a year, if not more, to see how that's doing. And you can lower your fat and your calories and also exercise, reducing saturated fat, um, keeping cholesterol in the diet low as well can help with high cholesterol. Impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. And obesity, of course, as we mentioned earlier, increases risk by, it increases that bad cholesterol and the triglycerides and decreases the good cholesterol. You can reduce your total calories and start exercising and work with your doctor, your dietitian, or your Cecilia health coach on a plan that's right for you. And lastly, that sedentary lifestyle, you know, it increases your risk significantly. Exercise, as we said earlier, it strengthens, strengthens the heart muscle, it tones muscles, aids in weight reduction, lowers your cholesterol, the bad one, helps your blood pressure and your resting heart rate. Not exercising won't give you any of these benefits.
So this is a little cartoon for those of you who are watching. It says, what fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours? You know, and there is humor in this, but it's also serious. You know, what's giving up a little time to be active so that you can live a much longer, healthier life? And an hour a day, that that's a big goal to really shoot out there. That might not be something that fits as a, an attainable or something that you can achieve right now. But we're going to talk about what are some good specific measurable goals that are good for you in your health. So the golden key exercise is that we're going to try to incorporate that. But we do have a few things, just a quick, quick note before we talk about the recommendations of how much. A few things that we want to make you, you know, caution if you have any of these things going on. Um, arthritis, osteoarthritis, back pain, neuropathy, Charcot's foot and retinopathy. Uh, of course, talking with your doctor prior to starting a new regimen is recommended. All of these um, are important because they could potentially cause more problems if um, you start and you don't know what things are safe and what things are not safe. Um, just like your Cecilia Health coach tells you, a minimum of at least once a year, you're recommended if you have diabetes to have a monofilament test on your feet. You know, ensuring your feet are healthy and you know that they're prepared to take on new activity in safe shoes is super important. The last thing we want is someone to be walking along and creating a blister that can go through a cascade of healing issues. I had a patient that once had um, went on a walk all of a sudden with his dog in these boat shoes, kind of like a slip-on shoes, and he did it for about a week. And since he did not know he had a numb area on his foot, he he made a really big wound right below his toes on the bottom. And when, all of a sudden he saw blood on his floor and he's like, what in the world is that? And it was just, he'd had a blister there. He didn't know it because he couldn't feel it. I mean, he had to go through a lot of therapy and medications, even IV antibiotics to heal that foot. So definitely make sure you are taking care of your feet and you've got shoes that are going to fit well and not make, you know, rub and hurt, make you have any sores. So some take home messages. Not exercising and being sedentary is just like smoking. It is just as bad as smoking. You're, you're not doing things that are going to really help you to improve your health. If you do not exercise, it has that same risk as if you were having a smoker, if you were a smoker. So start moving more and start an exercise program today and start what's right for you. And what's right for you may not be the same thing that's right for the next person. Okay, so let's talk about what are the differences. This is something when I ask patients, you know, how much exercise do you do? They might say, oh, you know, I work, I, there's this long hallway where I work, and I, I probably walk that eh, 10 times a day, I'm pretty sure. Well, that may not be quite the exercise I'm, I'm talking about. There is a difference between the two. Physical activity is movement that is carried out by the skeletal muscle, muscle that requires energy. And in other words, any movement that we do is physical activity. Me right now, I'm talking, you can't see me, but I got my hands moving. It's just the way I talk. I'm very, uh, you know, I show my, what I'm talking about with my hands. So I've got some extra calories I'm burning because I'm moving there. You can, you're moving, brushing your teeth as well. <laughs> but exercise is planned, structured, repetitive, and intentional movement that is intended to improve or maintain physical fitness. So I, do liken someone that says, I go out and I mow my lawn three days a week, or I go mow lawns three days a week. I do consider that an exercise because they are walking in a continuous pattern um, and they're doing it with the intent that it is part of their exercise as well. But if I have someone that's just, you know, I walk around my house and or I walk up and down my hall at work, that's more just physical activity. Okay. 
So the American College of Sports Medicine, these are the recommendations that they set uh, for the difference between the two. All adults should achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise per week. So there are different intensities too. So you could do 30 minutes to 60 minutes of moderate intensity, maybe five days a week, or you can do 20 to 60 minutes of vigorous intensity, three days a week. And it's okay to do that in short stints as well. Some people do maybe a 15 minute thing in the morning and a 15 minute thing at night, and that's fine. And I do often get the question, well, is there a time of day that's better? Getting it in is the priority. If you don't, if you hate getting up earlier in the morning to exercise and you dread it, it's, it may not be something that will fit your, what is normal for kind of your circadian rhythm or something that makes you happy. You might be dreading it and then it, you work it out of your routine, but maybe it's after dinner, after you're full and it makes you feel good to kind of go out there and get some of that energy out after you've already maybe eaten dinner. You know, it just, it depends on the person. So get it in where you can. That's my answer to that. There's not a particular time I'm going to tell you to put that in there. Adults should also do that resistance exercise. So this is something we want to do to help keep our muscles and our joints very strong as well. I know for ladies especially, we've got some bone degradation that can happen as we age and resistance exercise is what's recommended to help keep our bones strong. So very light or light resistance is best for if, if you were kind of previously sedentary and for older adults. So it shows a, a couple examples of like eight to 12 reps for power, 10 to 15 reps for strength, um, 15 to 20 reps for endurance and two to four uh, sets for strength and power. And there's lots of, you know, resistance exercises. You know, the gyms are often closed right now. I know most states, they're still not reopened. You can do things even like exercise bands at home. They have lots of great resistance exercises you can use. I actually had a program many moons ago in Kentucky. Um, we had older adults. They were at ages 50 to 70. We took their A1C. Um, and when they started the program and three months later, we took it again and they had to do um, three days a week resistance exercises with their exercise bands. And there were so many great benefits that the patient saw with that, not only their A1C lowering, but also doing that made them start kind of thinking about what they were eating and, and what are other ways I can insert more activity in. So they were just really being more mindful over the course of their whole health and it really showed great improvement. So you can do resistance exercises right at home. You can do it holding cans of green beans and do an arm lift. That alone can help give you some weight and help you exercise. So the American College of Sports Medicine, we're going to talk about um, those recommendations here again, improving health and blood glucose five times a week, 20 to 30 minutes and to lose and maintain weight bump it up a, a little bit more, five to seven times per week for 45 to 60 minutes. Your doctor may have even said, you know, you know, hey there, you know, if you lost just five to 10 pounds, you could really see a good improvement with your blood sugar management as well. And that's true. Oftentimes a five to 10 pound weight loss can really show um, a good difference in blood sugar. So take that into consideration as you're trying to set up what your plan is gonna be for exercise. So managing blood glucose during exercise. So what causes the low blood glucose um, during exercise? Now, overall, we want exercise to lower blood glucose, but we wanna be aware that unplanned activity or activity without possible medication adjustment or food adjustment could actually lead to low blood sugars or that hypoglycemia. There are two main reasons exercise could cause low blood glucose too much insulin in the bloodstream and not enough carbs to meet the needs of your body during the activity. Also, depending on the intensity or even the length of your activity, you know, you may need additional fuel from carbs during the activity or maybe extra before. And your body may need additional carbs um, to rebuild the, the glucose that's stored in your liver and muscle. So we'll talk more about the carbs in a few minutes, but this is why we, you might be having a low blood sugar. 
So it's about it's a kind of balancing act between your medications, exercises, and the amount of stored carbohydrates or carbohydrates that you eat. It's important to note that the risk of low blood sugars primarily applies to those taking insulin or certain oral medications that cause the pancreas to secrete more insulin, such as um, sulfonyl sulfonylureas that might be like glipizide, glomeparide, globuride, those are the sulfonylureas. If you're unsure how your medication works, then talk to your healthcare provider or your uh, Cecilia health coach. They can talk to you and whether or not they're one of the medications that you really need to be wary about. So what is a low blood glucose? Blood glucose less than 70 milligrams is considered low. A blood glucose 80 to 90 with symptoms is considered to be low as well. So what are some symptoms that you might have? There are lots and it depends on the person of what you might feel, but some really common ones are shakiness, you know, dizziness, you just can't really feel weak, maybe sweating more than usual, you feel really, really hungry, headaches, pale skin, you might look a little bit pasty, um, maybe a sudden moodiness or, you know, a change in your behavior. Maybe I had a lady that said I, that she used to just cry for no reason when, and then she knew it was low. So that's a symptom. Um, seizing, that's a, a seizure is a really a more of a major symptom of that. If you have trouble paying attention, if things are really confusing in your area, that can be a sign. Also tingling sensations around the mouth, that can be as well. So what are we, what are, are we gonna do about that though? So low blood glucoses, glucoses, um, if, you're, if you experience low blood glucoses, you can see right here that you're wanting to treat it with what we call the rule of 15. You may have heard this from your physician or a nurse or your Cecilia health coach, but this is where if you have a blood sugar that's lower than 70, if it's between 50 and 70 actually, that you'll have 15 grams of carbohydrates and then you recheck your sugar 15 minutes later. That's the part that most people miss is checking it 15 minutes later. And the reason that's important is if your blood sugar was really, like say you had a 64 blood sugar and you took your 15 grams of carbs in and then you didn't recheck your sugar, what if your blood sugar was in the momentum of really going down quickly? That one treatment of 15 grams may not have been enough. You may need to do it again. And if in 15 minutes later, if you recheck your sugar and it's still not above 70, you do the same thing again. You'll do 15 grams of carbs and recheck it again 15 minutes later. Now, if your blood sugar is lower than 50, you would double that and do 30 grams of carbohydrates and then recheck your, your sugar 15 minutes later. So some examples of what could be 15 grams, it could be three to four glucose tablets. It could be a half a cup of fruit juice or a couple tablespoons of raisins. Also, I have patients that keep different candies on hand like jelly belly beans. They're one gram of carbs per bean. So they may have like individual bags of jelly belly beans. My little kiddos that had type one diabetes love those as a treatment if they had a low. We had those always bagged up just in case. Um, you know, Sour Patch Kids and Skittles and um, those little Smarties, those are all good. And what you notice with all of those, they're only sugar. There's no protein in it, there's no fat in it. All you want in that moment is to have a straight carbohydrate because your only priority is getting that to come up above 70. And after it's above that, then you can go ahead and have a good snack. Sometimes people feel like they need a snack once it's risen because they kind of still feel weak. Um, and that's okay at that point. But in the moment of a low, you all only want to treat it with just a carb. So what can we do to reduce your chance of having the low blood glucose in the first place? You know, we definitely don't want it. So it can be really frustrating too. You know, you're trying to do a good thing and then you're experiencing these lows and then you're feeling like you need to eat more. And we want to try to help you plan ahead, uh, you know, rather than, you know, to prevent that from happening. One way is to start to make sure you keep a record of what your blood glucose does before and after exercise. Not everybody's blood sugar kind of reacts the same. Some people's blood sugar goes up when they exercise. But um, 
keep a record of what, what you're seeing happening. This is especially important if you are on insulin or pills that help the pancreas make more insulin, those sulfonylureas that we talked about earlier. So if you test your blood sugar and it's less than 100, make sure you have a snack that is at least 15 grams of carbs. Um, a few examples we have here, um, some crackers, a small piece of fruit, a yogurt. It is good to have like a little protein with it, not just a straight carbohydrate. So if you have like a small piece of fresh fruit, maybe have um, some almonds with it. If you have some crackers, maybe have like peanut butter and crackers. The yogurt, it does have carbs and it has protein too. So that that's a good plan. Also for low blood glucose during exercise, you may want to try having like a, a 15 to 30 gram carb consumed about every 30 to 60 minutes of exercise, especially if you're doing like a really long routine. You might even be doing a 5K. I mean, maybe you're planning for that. So you may need to have something in the midst of that exercise to help keep your blood sugars stable as you're going along. So what is a low blood glucose post-exercise? So like we mentioned earlier, we were wanting to check your pre and post. So before we like seeing around 110 to 140, and that's if you're on insulin and if you're taking pills above 90, that's before. After exercise, um, the oral agents higher than 90 and the insulin higher than 110. And their children have their own criteria of what um, is the, there's the 120 to 130. So high blood glucose, high blood glucose is post exercise. So reduce your chance of that. We want to um, to reduce that chance of low blood glucose after exercise. Remember that blood glucose can be lowered many hours after you exercise. So for this reason, it's a good idea to have carbs and your meter nearby. Oftentimes, I'll tell patients just bring in kind of your toolbox of things you need at the gym, have your meter, have a carb source, um, and your supplies. Of, oftentimes too, if you've got one of those bracelets or something that can identify that you've got diabetes, that's a good idea as well. High intensity exercises can lower your blood glucose faster and for longer. So how long were you active also needs to be considered. Um, as we mentioned before, you know, monitoring your blood glucose before and after will help you, you know, really learn the effects of activity on your blood glucose. Um, this is important, you know, every person's responses, like I said, very different. You may want to, you may even want to check your sugar during the, like the middle of your exercise, and you might want to check your exercise before you go to bed at night. That, that lag effect of what if affects your blood sugars, we don't want you going to bed with you know, an, an 82 blood sugar that might be dropping because you this exercise is really, really in health. You may need to have a snack before bed if it's too low. So yeah, check before you go to bed as well. Here's another one of those cartoons. I was hoping you'd let me know how much more insulin I need to take if I, de if I decide to supersize my order. <laughs> so you do really want to educate yourself on what you need to do with your diet and how to make adjustments with medications and what are some good snacks. We've already listed some great snacks today, but one thing we know for sure, exercise alone is not the cure-all. A bad diet can negate the positive changes that you've made, okay? Um, I've, got, I've got people who will, will run miles, but if they come and they eat cheeseburgers and they snack all day long you know all of those good things they've done they've either they've either just kind of washed it like an equal or they've maybe even hurt themselves even more so remember 3500 calories is one pound and you need a deficit of 500 calories over the course of seven days to have you know hypothetically to lose that one pound now some people have these fluctuations with, you know, fluid and hormones that can change different things. And oftentimes when you're right out the gate making changes with your diet and exercise, you'll see this initial weight loss and then you'll have this lag time where you don't have any light weight loss. Just persist. Your body has, is making some adjustments and adjust, adjustments and trying to figure out what you're doing differently. But if you persist, it will start showing again. And remember, Maybe take some measurements. Not only is that abdominal area a great place to take measurements, but also like your upper arm, like where your bicep is, that's a great place. Your chest, that's a great place. Um, some people even measure like their thigh, maybe putting their arms 
like um, right by their hand, right by their thigh, seeing where that lands and measuring right there. So you can take measurements. If you're not seeing the weight change, you may really be seeing the, the inches change. So don't, don't leave that out. That could really help encourage and motivate you too. So diet is the weight loser and physical activity is the weight maintainer. So let's look here at the effects of exercise on weight loss. So you see here, I'm going to push this along right here. Uh, we have on one side weight loss in kilograms, and then we've got at the horizontal no exercise versus exercise and weeks on the diet. So we have zero to eight weeks on the diet. So you'll see here that people with no exercise, yes, they lost weight as well, but not at the same rate. The people who did exercise and had a diet in play as well, making healthier choices, they lost more. And here we're going to go on a little bit more, some longer months, at eight months with no diet. You see here the people who are exercising, they're either maintaining or they might, and then you see the people who don't exercise, they start to go up. Okay. So these are habits along the way that we really want to see, see you achieve and help you maintain your, your healthy habits as well. And this chart goes on for longer months as well and the effects and the people who um, exercise and have physical activity or exercise and their diet as well, they obviously will see the better benefits. This was from a, I like this, this was a 160 male policeman. That's what the study was on too. too. <laughs> so I guess those policemen, it was funny. I had a little cartoon of policemen with donuts. So these policemen probably did not have those donuts. <laughs> All right. So adjusting insulin. And again, we don't, as a diabetes, a certified diabetes education care specialist, we don't change your insulin as we talk, work with you guys on the phone. So you might want to talk with your doctor about what is the appropriate adjustment that you need to make. But here's just <clears throat> a typical uh, change that you might see with a patient on reducing like Humalog, that quick acting insulin, the Humalog, Novolog, or regular, they may change from two to one units. Um, and then the MPH or 70-30 insulins, um, they may go from four to two. So you see here, they're often cut in half. Um, the Lantus and Levomir, they're not usually adjusted um, because they're like a 20 to 24 hour insulin. Uh, sometimes they are, you might be taking like a morning and evening dose. Sometimes doctors will adjust one or the other too, but it's usually those quick really fast acting insulins that are kind of cut down and you will need to talk with your doctor about that you're anytime a new really consistent change in meals that you're doing like I have patients who really get their carbs cut back a lot and then they're like I'm dropping all the time I need to constantly fix these lows no we don't want to you know we're happy that you've made these changes with your diet we need to get your doctor to adjust your medicine. That's what we want to do. We don't want you to have to keep treating low blood sugars. It's just that your meds need to be adjusted. So always talk to your doctor. These are just some general guidelines. So here's a, a few routines that we see across the board. Um, if you've got a 30 minute exercise, you want to have about a 15 to 30 gram carbohydrate snack. If you're exercising an hour, then you'd want to have the 15 to 30 grams as well, but also have protein with it. Um, and then if it's an hour or more, you would want to have the 15 to 30 grams of carbs, also protein with it too, and make sure that your medication's adjusted if you're doing that. Okay, so which should I do here? If you, you know, if you are taking insulin, if you've got planned activity, we know we have to make adjustments with that. So, so if you know that, you know, we're going to have dinner tonight and then we're going to go on a walk around the neighborhood. If you're taking like a mealtime insulin, you, you know, you're going to be burning a lot of sugar right after you eat. So we're going to need to make some adjustments with that. You know, we're wanting to lose, you know, maybe or maintain weight that might be weight loss might not be a goal of yours. You just might be doing this for the for the cardiovascular benefit for it. So think about what nutritional needs you need to have in your body to make sure you don't lose weight. Maybe you need to um, work with your edu your diabetes educator on what's a good amount of calories or, or nutrition I need to make sure I have so I don't lose weight. Um, and this will obviously improve your control. 
and make sure you do have good snacks on hand for those long activities and for unplanned things for sure it happens sometimes where like it's unexpected I didn't realize I was going to be being doing that much intense exercise and so have a snack to kind of compensate if you've got that sugar, extra sugar burning so when should you not exercise there are definitely some times that are not the best days to exercise sick days if you're having some respiratory issues or a system a systemic versus a head cold um, some of these you can still do some basic activities but your body's already in overdrive of trying to help compensate and fix your body so you want to caution especially when blood sugars are over 250 you want to check for ketones if so we have ketone strips and meters as well um, if no ketones go right ahead so if you have type 2 diabetes, if you're over 400, stop. You need to, to fix what's going on, see what, you know, if there, there's a dangerous, some dangerous things that can happen if your blood sugar is too high um, and it continues to be high as well. Type 1, if it's over 300, check your blood sugar within 5 to 10 minutes um, and the blood sugar should be dropping with the activity. But if not, you know, you need to to stop and adjust based on your plan that you have set with your physician with your insulin adjustments. Always check for ketones if you have type 1 diabetes when your sugar is over 250. If you have ketones, stop. That is the recommendation. So managing blood sugars. Being prepared may also improve your success at building and maintaining and an active lifestyle. I recommend, like I said earlier, that you have these items all ready to go and that you are, you know, make sure it's not a thing that you're rushing out the door and you forget them. So be prepared. Most people have those ID bracelets or the necklaces already on, um, on your phone. You can put that as well. I don't know if I don't have um, the Androids. I know on the Apple devices, you can put emergency information on your phone and there's ways that if something happened, they could contact your emergency contact really easily and quickly. Um, pack a small pouch with your meter and your carbohydrate source, like your glucose tablets or your raisins or your candy, whatever you're choosing. Grab your water bottle, make sure you stay really hydrated and make sure to wear those good shoes very important. We don't want that rubbing sore going on there. Okay, so setting goals. We want to set SMART goals, and that SMART, I know if you've been on a previous webinar this year, we talked about setting up these goals because they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, you know, an example of this, a really simple one would be, I will walk five days every week for 30 minutes each week. Or maybe you have to build it up slowly. Maybe you have to say, over the course of this month, here are my goals. In week one, I'm gonna walk 10 minutes, three days a week. In week two, I'm gonna walk 10 minutes, five days a week. Week three, I'm gonna walk 15 minutes, five days a week. In week four, I'm gonna work towards 15 minutes, five days a week to reach that goal in one month. So you might wanna just kinda of do that good stair step model all the way up, okay? So if five minutes is your starting point, or I'm gonna start with doing the resistance bands exercises twice a week in my home. Maybe you already do some activity outside, but maybe the resistance exercise is what you need to incorporate. Set that as your SMART goal. So I think this is funny. This is a, if you are listening to it on the phone, what it is is a 24 hour fitness and there's literally an escalator that goes up to the 24 hour fitness. <laughs> so, you know, you, this says two things. It's funny that these people are trying to go make themselves work out, get their energy built up and burn calories, but yet they use the escalator. So, you know, use opportunities where you can also burn more energy. So use the steps, walk further to your car at the grocery store, anywhere that you can kind of get in more bang for your buck of burning calories and sugar, work it in there. And the elevator to success is out of order. You'll have to use the stairs one step at a time. And it really is that, you know, if you don't meet your goal this week, don't live in the past, live in the future. What can you do differently this week? What didn't work last week? What was your roadblock that got you there? Was it, 
you know, your schedule. What do you need to change with your schedule? I have a lady that works at a hospital and her admin admin is now blocking her one hour for lunch so she can make sure she takes a 15 minute walk and she always takes her bolus of insulin. So she has gone out of her way to make that work. Otherwise, she just gets way too busy and she's missing her medicine and she's sitting at her desk all day. So what is it that you need to do to make it work with your schedule? All right, that was a lot of information here. So I'm going to take a look over here and, and see what questions we might have from our audience. So just if you see over on the side, if you want to type in a question, I'll take a look and see what we've got here. All right, I see one here already. Is juice better than pop for my blood sugar? So it, a half a cup of pop and a half a cup of, of juice is about the same amount of carbs. So pop is often a time or another thing that we tell patients, if you have a low blood sugar, drink it, you know, because in that moment of a low blood sugar, our only goal is to get that above 70. If you kind of, you know, compare the nutritional value of pop versus orange juice, of course, orange juice has some vitamins and minerals that are beneficial for your well-being. But if you're just talking about juice in terms of treating your low blood sugar, pop is fine as well. It might even be the thing that's more um, practical wherever you're at. There may not be juice, so pop might be the thing. I know the little tiny, there are juice boxes that are fine at room temperature, but also the little mini pops, those are a little over 15 grams, but they're a good quick thing that you could pop open and use as a resource. Do I need to cut out my carbs? Oh no, no, you do not need to cut out your carbs. And you know, the the fads of today, the low carb culture that you really see out there. First of all, what's really frustrating about that is what maybe one person may have had a medical need that indicated they do need to do a really low carb diet. There are situations where people do the ketogenic diet or different fasting styles of diets, but across the board and research shows that a consistent carbohydrate diet is best for diabetes management, especially if you're going to start incorporating more activity. If you were to go no carb or extreme low carb, you're going to likely see negative outcomes with your blood sugar management. Even a person who does carbs for breakfast and does them for dinner, but doesn't do them in the middle of the day, they're going to see some poor blood sugar management because they go too long without eating. So you do not want to cut them out. And definitely talk with your Cecilia health coach on what is good for you. There is a specific amount for men and women. And we love to do that on our calls as far as really making it specific for you. We can also tailor it to, like, say you are a person who likes to have snacks as well. Like you like to have snacks between meals or at night. So we can really work to make that fit your schedule. So don't cut out the carbs at all. We want you to have the carbs and, and um, have them in a healthy and a balanced way. All right. I'm not checking my blood sugar. Should I be? So, you know, your doctor will, that's where it starts of, as to whether or not you are prescribed to be doing it. And oftentimes they'll give you um, like a script. They'll say, check sugar once a day. And that's what your pharmacy gets. So that's what they feel for you. Um, or they might say a few times a week. So three times a week. So with diabetes management, it's a really great idea to know where you're at. And, you know, especially if you're taking medications that have a lowering effect, it is definitely best that you have a meter and you have supplies on hand to check. If you're feeling those symptoms, we want to make sure that you've got what you need to check it. So my advice, if your doctor does not want you to check it or says, I don't need you, you got good control, you're, you're not on any medicines that lower your sugar, um, that information is not useful for us, then no, you wouldn't check it. But the majority of people who have diabetes, it is indicated that you would check your sugar. It not only is indicated to know, to tell you what, how you're doing, but also in case you're feeling, like I said, those symptoms, you want to make sure you can address them. I always tell patients, you know, the hemoglobin A1C, we always ask that one. That's the blood sugar average that we test for every three to six months. It is like the cover to a book. It tells, it's, it's, it's your story, but the blood sugars you test in between are what tell the story. They're the pages. 
I can have someone have a spectacular A1C. I've had one that had a, say a 6.7 A1C, but their blood sugars ranged from 50 to 200. And that's not good. We don't like seeing 50s and we don't like it bouncing from 50 to 200. That's a really big gap. So checking sugars, there are lots of benefits for it and there are lots of reasons for it. So talk to your doctor as to if they want you to, and if so, how much to do. Well, all right, that's all the questions I have for today. Oh, thank you guys so much for attending. This was great. Um, the next webinar will be on Tuesday, June 16th at six. It's Mythbusters, Separating Fact from Fiction, Finally Diabetes Unveiled. And this is gonna be a great one. I, I like that gal here who asked about carbs, you know, separating fact from fiction, you really, it's good to know like what, you know, who, should you listen to who should you believe and what really is fact um, next one after that will be july 22nd diabetes and your diet taking it to the next level all right thank you guys again so much you can attend your events talk to your coach if you want to um, get more information you can also visit us on facebook we do have text reminders we can send to you guys so ask your coach about that as well and we thank you guys so much for joining us and appreciate your attendance and participation thanks for all the great questions hope you all have a wonderful night